Hello and welcome to The Rest is History with me, Dominic Sandbrook, and my friend, Tom Holland. Hello. <laughs> we've come to, we've come to uh, the subject of Holland. The Netherlands. Yeah, we're going to do the whole thing in the in Dutch accents. I'm sure everybody will find that enormously amusing. So anyway, yes, Tom, you are very keen on the Netherlands, not merely because you're called Holland, I think, but because you genuinely... Yeah, that's part of it. You like the history, don't you, of the Dutch Republic? And I do, I do. Uh, and actually, the book that got me interested in it, I'm sure like so many people, is Simon Sharma's The Embarrassment of Riches, which was his first great book, came out late 80s. I think I read it at university. Yeah. A brilliant portrait of the Dutch Republic in its golden age. Mm-hmm. And I've read and reread it. And I always remember there's a particular sequence about the, the significance of housework Right. to the Dutch in yeah. their golden age. Such a glamorous subject, Tom. It is a glamorous. Well, it's it's a very, very interesting subject, I think. you. Ha- I know that you disagree about this, don't you? you, are, you you're sceptical. But the subject of today's Dutch-themed episode is the Maid of Holland, the Hollandse Markt. I hope that my conversation there was right. Yeah. <laughs> um, and the Maid of Holland emerges um, in the late 16th century as basically the most potent symbol of the Dutch Republic. And so I thought it would be interesting to ask, you know, who is she? Yeah. Why? What are the symbolic resonances? Um, and I know you're sceptical, but I'm going to try and convince you that this is actually a fascinating topic. To start with, explain. So we are in what, the 17th century? No, we oh. are a little bit earlier. We're, okay. we're in the, the late 16th century. This is the Dutch revolt against um, the Spanish yeah, and this is the kind of the northern part of uh, the, of the Lowlands. People remember that uh, episode we did on Burgundy with Bart van Loo, that these cities, these kind of city states, which today would in- embrace the Netherlands and Belgium, yeah, um, that they they had their golden age under the Dukes of Burgundy. They then become part of the Habsburg inheritance, and so in the 1560s. The northern part of the Netherlands, what will become the Dutch Republic, mm-hmm. is is uh, becoming ever more Protestant yeah. uh, and specifically Calvinist. And therefore, that gives a, a religious dimension to the resentment that they feel about their distant Spanish overlord, Philip II. Yeah. And from the mid-1560s onward, you get this process of kind of, of revolt and rebellion until in 1588, the Dutch Republic is officially proclaimed. And English listeners, of course, 1588 is the year of the Spanish Armada. And people remember that the whole point of the Spanish Armada is that it's going to sail up to the lowlands and take on the Spanish armies that are there. And the reason that there are Spanish armies in the lowlands is because they are busy fighting the rebellious Dutch. And 15 years before the official proclamation of the Dutch Republic, the, the rebels had issued a medal that had the two words libertas, so freedom and patria, fatherland, motherland, um, stamped on it. And the emblem on this medal was a maiden wearing a hat seated within a garden with a fence around it. And this this maiden is Hollandia, right. who is a figure from medieval allegory. Um, in the Middle Ages, every city, every town, every region would have a, you know, be represented by an allegorical female figure. So, so that's where she's coming from. But on this medal, she's freighted with all kinds of extra symbolism and moral weight. So there are ob- obviously, it won't surprise you to, to hear from me, Dominic, there are very strong Christian echoes here. You astound me, Tom. And specifically of the Virgin Mary. Right. Um, so this is a Protestant revolt. So the kind of the Mariolatry of the Middle Ages is something that's been parked by the, the Dutch rebels. But, you know, you don't suppress the memory of something as potent as the imagery of the Virgin overnight. So just as in England, Elizabeth I becomes Gloriana. She kind of takes on a lot of the allure and the glamour and the symbolic potency of the Virgin Mary, becomes a kind of Protestant equivalent of the Virgin Mary. So with this um, this medal, this image of the Maid of Holland, the idea of the garden that can't be broken into in the yeah. Middle Ages, this serves as an emblem of, of Mary's virginity. Uh, and so at a time when the Dutch rebels are trying to create a kind of impregnable border between them and the Spanish armies. Mm-hmm. And also, of course, because their their towns and their fields have been redeemed from the North Sea by dikes. Right. Yeah. The, the idea of a kind of unbreachable wall is very, very potent in the Dutch imagination. Um, and what you see 
in uh, in in the early years of the Dutch Revolt is that as they they you know it's kind of iconoclastic approach to um, churches and cathedrals, and the stained glass window will be destroyed. When they repair them, often the Maid of Holland replaces the Virgin in the, the iconography of these stained glass windows. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. You, thank you, Dominic. Thank you. So that is interesting. That's a, I'm chalking that up as a victory. So there's there's that kind of Christian angle, but then yeah. there's also a classical angle. So in um, in antiquity, the the hat it's actually a kind of Phrygian hat is the emblem of freedom that is given to slaves. So that's why uh, French revolutionaries wear Phrygian hats. Um, the hat that the uh, the maid is wearing is is a, a kind of it's a more kind of typical hat, but it's still, it's serving as an image of liberty. And in due course, um, actually the, the rebels will start minting medals that, um, that, that just show the hat. So the hat becomes a kind of, you know, a totem yeah. of Dutch liberty. But of course the other, um, very, very celebrated, symbolically freighted, uh, virgin, female virgin is Minerva, Athena, the goddess of wisdom, who is also a warrior. Yep. Famous for her helmet. Tom, famous for her helmet yeah yes absolutely um and the idea of the maid of holland as a kind of athena figure a minerva figure enables uh, the the uh, the people who are kind of manufacturing this image to allude to real life examples of women who display their heroism and their virtue by defying the spanish and there's one person in particular who is a kind of absolute totem of dutch heroism who's a woman uh, in harlem she's a wood merchant uh, by the name of kenna simmons dr hasseler very good okay, if i pronounced that, that right superb and in 1573 the spanish have put harlem under siege they've destroyed the walls and again, you know, again and again, the significance of walls, of dikes, of barriers, so important to the Dutch rebels. And so the people of Harlem, they work tirelessly night and day to try and um, uh, and repair the breaches. And Kenau is the woman who becomes the emblem of this repair work. She she never stops. She's absolutely indefatigable. And over the course of the, the years and then the decades that follow, stories told about her become ever kind of more implausible. So it's said that she, um, basically she develops the necklace. You remember the, the necklace in South Africa? It's kind of burning uh, rubber tires that get thrown over neck. So, so this is what she's doing. She's throwing wreaths of tar over the necks of the, uh, of the Spanish soldiers. This is her, her signature. Yeah. Her signature way of killing them. By the 17th century, you're getting prints showing her as a full-blown warrior. She's holding a pike. She has a sword. She has a pistol. So actually, the comparison is Joan of Arc, surely. I mean, that's the obvious antecedent, well, isn't it? Kind of, except that Kenau is actually, she's she's not a maid. So she is, she's a, a middle-aged woman. She's kind of 40. Right. And there's a, there's a painting of her in the Rijksmuseum where she's painted w without any kind of hint of idealization. She's the you know she's the kind of woman you would see you know in a in a shop or whatever, but she's she's got all her weapons, and I think it's the it's the contrast between the fact that she you know she looks like an absolutely conventional ordinary middle aged woman, and the fact that she's kind of bristling with pistols and all right. kinds of things, yeah, and and it has this inscription: "See here, a woman called Kenau, brave as a man, who in that time gallantly fought the Spanish tyrant." So this is hurrah, yeah, um, and. By the 19th century, the stories are being told that she's leading a band of 300 female warriors. So again, a kind of classical echo, perhaps, yeah. of the Spartans at Thermopylae. And there are other stories, too, of, of women defying the Spaniards. And basically, the Maid of Holland is reminding the Dutch of this tradition of heroic women. And it's reflective of the fact that, that women, as well as men, are valorized, are seen as being heroic by yeah. the people who commemorate the, the glory days of the revolt against the Spanish. But I think there is something much more interesting going on as well. Okay. So the idea that, you know, of, of, of warrior maidens, I mean, you mentioned Joan of Arc. I mean, this is a kind of tradition. It's an unusual tradition, but it's not an unheard of tradition. Yeah. But I think there is something about the Maid of Holland that is absolutely distinctive completely distinctive and so interesting about the character of the Dutch Republic and of its civilization in the golden age. And I think we should take a break here. And then when I come back, we will. When you come back? No, when we come back. Well, I'm coming back too. Yeah. Sorry. Did I say, did I say, just say me? I, I you said when I come back. Okay. Well, I'm, I, 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 I'm so in the zone, Dominic, that I'm afraid I blanked you out. When we come back, uh, we will explore 
what it is that, that makes the figure of the Maid of Holland so culturally distinctive. Jolly good. Welcome back to The Rest is History. Contrary to uh, predictions before the interval, I have returned. I am still here. I am listening to Tom's uh, l wonderful discourse about the Maid of Holland. So, Tom, there's been an interesting sort of contradiction in the first half because you said you were going to be talking about housework, but actually you're talking about pistol work. Yes, I have been talking about pistols and guns, yeah. and you're absolutely right. Uh, well spotted. Uh, so we are now going to start exploring the dimension of housework. Oh, so now we're getting to the really interesting bit. So the problem with podcasts, of course, is that you, if you want to talk about visual things, you, there has to be very detailed descriptions. But you defy that. So I'm going to defy that. So I want to talk about, um, it's an allegory on the deceitfulness of Spain and the liberty and prosperity of the Dutch Republic, which was an image on a pamphlet that was issued in 1615. I'm looking it up live. This is very exciting. So, so what you get. I see it. Yeah. You get the Maid of Holland. There she is. She sat in her walled and fertile and prosperous garden. Over her are the arms of the various provinces of the Dutch Republic and of the House of Orange, which will give in due course a king in the form of William III to Britain. There are two uh, Dutch men who are busy tending the garden, making all the kind of the tulips and so on grow. And at the gate, you have a Dutch lion, the, the emblem of Holland, yes. uh, guarding the gate. And outside it, you have uh, the Spanish army and you have a hostile leopard. Yes. And, and the inscription, see the leopard's nature that is not to be trusted. So the leopard is emblematic. In Spain. Spain and popery and everything bad. But there's also another note, which is note the wisdom of renowned Dutch housekeeping. Oh, yes. And so that is the, um, Huys, the two men. I don't know how to pronounce that. Huishoven or something like that, is it? What a splendid image that is. So the, the garden is incredibly neat and sort of domesticated, yes. isn't it? And if you think of, of Amsterdam or Leiden or yeah. any of the, the kind of the great cities of the Dutch Republic, it's that kind of, it's that order, it's that neatness. Yeah. And that is what is being symbolically represented with the pyramid um, within in the, center, the garden. Interestingly. Um, there well, you, you can't go wrong with a pyramid. So note the wisdom of renowned Dutch housekeeping. What does housekeeping mean? Well, there are various levels. So there is the literal, the making of, of houses, of gardens, of cities, because, you know, the Netherlands is redeemed from mud. It was all kind of mud and bog and water. Yeah. And so, you know, the walls of the gardens are the, basically the dikes that, that keep the sea at bay. But there's also, of course, the sense of, of housekeeping that stereotypically women do. And again, it's about, it's about mud. It's about keeping the filth at bay. And it's the way in which, for the Dutch, the house and the cleanliness of the house becomes emblematic of, of what their republic is all about. So Simon Sharma, in, his, in uh, The Embarrassment of Riches, he quotes from a household manual that's called The Experienced and Knowledgeable Dutch Householder. And it overtly compares the, the weekly um, kind of uh, routine of housekeeping to the, uh, the rituals that you might get in a church. So it has a sacral quality, Dominic, a sacral Very good. quality. Like a sacral so, quality. So, so, to, so to quote Sharma, the steps in front of the house, the path leading to the house, if any, and the front hall were all to be washed every weekday early in the morning. On Wednesdays, the entire house was to be gone over. Monday and Tuesday afternoons were devoted to dusting and polishing reception rooms and bedrooms. Thursdays were scrubbing and scouring days. And Fridays were assigned to the unenviable job of cleaning the kitchen and cellar. Uh, obviously, you also have to do the laundry. You have to keep the dishes washed. You have to sweep the cobwebs. You have to scrub the steps, but not just the steps. You also have to scrub the paving stones that extend beyond the steps and beyond the house. Right. So that's also kind of part of the remit. That's your sort of civic duty, right? It's your civic participation. participation. Absolutely your civic duty. And people can, therefore can tell if you have a, a slatternly household. Yeah. If, if, you know, the housewife of the household is sluttish. Uh, if she is failing to uh, to keep the um, the paving stones in front of the house clean, then the house inside must be dirty. Tom, you and said that with the with the relish of a UKIP MEP. <laughs> Not at all. Uh, it's 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 the relish of a good Dutch seventeenth century Calvinist, because the thing is that to us this actually seems quite normal. Uh, you know, the idea of cleanliness. Yeah, we talked about this in the context of the Royal Navy. In the, in the late 18th and 19th century, that they, they obsessively clean because they have 
come to realize that this is what keeps germs at bay. But in the 17th century, the idea that you keep not just your house clean, but you keep the streets clean seems to visitors to the Dutch Republic the absolute height of, I mean, kind of insane. I mean, they find it weird. And so English visitors say who go there, they find it very, very peculiar that you can't spit. You know, if you go into a house um, and you don't take your shoes off, the maid will come and basically kind of rough you up and pull your shoes off by force and put your feet into a pair of slippers. So one English traveler describes the Dutch as perfect slaves to cleanliness. You know, they, they yeah. see it as being very, very peculiar. And for the Dutch, this is a totem of their of what makes them distinctive. So when they portray the Maid of Holland, they may sometimes show her with a spear, but they will also just as probably show her with a mop because the wall around the garden is the same as the wall around a house and the wall around the Dutch Republic. And that idea of keeping something intact, keeping it clean, keeping it ordered. That yeah. is, it operates right the way from the individual household, right the way to the whole fabric of, of the Republic. And essentially what is being cleaned is the dirt of foreign intervention, of popery, of laziness, and therefore the cleanliness of a house becomes emblematic of the way that the Dutch have been chosen by God for yeah. a, a kind of providential role in his plan. Right. So it's a very ca- kind of Calvinist yes. take. You know, the Calvinism has a, 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 at its idea that there is an elect, that, that God chooses who will be redeemed and who weren't. And so a house becomes, the clean house becomes the emblem of, of redemption, basically. Yeah. And so what's, what's amazing is that, that the whole Dutch revolt, this whole incredible heroic story, which does, as you pointed out, feature women with cutlasses and pistols and all that kind of stuff. But it, it's also cast as a great project of housekeeping, of cleaning and sweeping and polishing and scrubbing. Yeah. Um, and this is operating on all kinds of different dimensions. So it's, it's, it's obviously very, very patriotic. And Dominic, I know that you love you love a, a Dutch admiral, don't you? You're obsessed with sea battles in the 1650s and 1660s. When we were doing the Battle of Trafalgar, I couldn't keep you off it. So you will remember. <laughs> yeah. You will remember Admiral Martin Tromp. Do you remember him? Big fan of him. Crazy name, crazy guy. Yeah. So, so he was a, he was a, a, a famous Dutch admiral. Yeah. Um, who was very successful at fighting the English, and he fixed a broom to the bowsprit of his flagship. Uh, and the idea was that he would sweep, sweep the English, sw- sweep the English off the channel. Well, we know how that worked out. <laughs> um, but it's amazing. You know, it's it's amazing. It's incredible. The, the, yeah. This is the mar- This is the emblem of housework, martial housework, <laughs> martial housework. Yeah, nautical housework. I mean, you can't imagine Nelson doing that. No, definitely. Um, not. And of course, it's Protestant. Yeah, because you are, you know, sweeping away all, all the flummery and the. Yeah. ornamentation of Catholic churches and replacing it with the whitewashed sobriety of a Calvinist yes, church. I was thinking about the churches. So they are, I mean, that's what strikes you when you go into a Calvinist church, right? The, the, it's, it's spacious, it's light, it's very clean. It's, it's rigorously, meticulously maintained. There's no, there are no sort of dusty cobwebby corners with gilt no. kind of effigies or something. No. So, so therefore cleanliness and housework is, is seen as very Protestant. And further way, way in which that is the case is that for Calvinists to know that you are redeemed, to know that you are one of the elect, you have to look into your soul and kind of cleanse it of every speck of dirt. Right. Yeah. Um, because if that, if the, if those specks of dirt are, are starting to accumulate, then you have to fear for the, the future of your immortal soul. Um, and so basically the, you know, the responsible housewife is being cast as the archetype of the good Calvinist. Yeah. She is her, her scrubbing of a, a, a step, her polishing of a candlestick is to be equated to the cleansing of a soul. And so you know, there's a lot of misogyny in in Dutch culture in the 17th century, as you know, as there is in, mm-hmm. in, in all cultures at this time. But cleaning women are invariably portrayed in positive light. Right. A, a woman who is keeping a house clean is emblematic of, of everything that is good. And I think that, so Sh- Sharma's, th- um, you know, his, the, the brilliant case that he makes in The Embarrassment of Riches, he says, the struggle between worldliness and homeliness was but another variation on the classic Dutch counterpoint between materialism and morality. So it's the, the, this idea that on the one hand, 
Dutch culture in the 17th century is precociously materialist. This is where capitalism is being stress tested for the first time. You have merchants who are kind of going out beyond the enclosing wall of the Dutch Republic, out into the world, off to the Indies, whatever, bringing back spices and enabling individual households in, say, Amsterdam or Leiden or whatever, to become rich in a way that individual households had never been rich before. This is the first great bourgeois state, if you want yeah. to put it like that. But this obviously spells danger because wealth can be corrupting. But if you clean it, if you scrub it, then you are keeping that risk at bay. So the, uh, the idea that you can simultaneously be rich and virtuous requires this idealization of housework. Yeah. And that's why in Dutch art in this period, famously, it's so domestic. You know, right. there's a lot of emphasis on domesticity. Still and, lifes, uh, all that sort of stuff. All that kind of stuff. So you see a lot of paintings of, of women doing housework, of, uh, you know, maids uh, around the laundry chest, uh, lots of pictures of women checking their children's hair for knits. <laughs> and, you know, this is, this is kind of material for art that would be unthinkable in previous places and in previous ages. And yeah. I think it's, it's, it makes the Dutch Republic such a kind of fascinating, fascinating civilization and a civilization that is kind of at the head of everything that modernity will be. It's patriotic, domesticated. It's all about privacy, individualism. Yeah, because if you think about it, you know, the English are coming over and they're kind of dirty and smelly and spitting and they've got their dirty boots. But in, basically what the, what the Dutch are doing in the 17th century is what the British will do in the 19th century with their idealization of the home. Very similar yeah. ways that it's, you know, the British Empire will be profiting from the riches that are being brought in from the outside world, just as the Dutch do in the 17th century. And likewise, a way of kind of domesticating this is to make a fetish of housework, of house cleaning, of the feminine character of the house. So yeah. I think I think it is, I, I hope I've convinced you that that, that they is They have convinced me. I mean, the idea that Dutch maid is still, so I Googled Dutch maid um, earlier. and um, <laughs> So this is like with when you... <laughs> when you had your laptop on the... Uh, what, when I was watching Adam Curtis's tr- <laughs> uh, programme about Russia in the 1990s. Yeah. So what comes up with Dutch Maid? I haven't well, what comes up with... So Dutch Maid, you'll be pleased to hear, is not a kind of erotic niche. It is... Uh, it, it's a sort of... The, the brand, particularly in America, actually, Tom, the images of Dutch maids, maids that are pretty... Uh, yeah, they recur again and again. So the, there are Dutch Maid cigars. There's a company in... Uh, where is it? Tennessee? That makes... <laughs> That makes um, pies, Dutch made pies. I mean, I, I'm, I'm giving them free advertising. They make uh, <laughs> all kinds of all kinds of fried pies. They say I don't know. Oh, what I don't know. I'm not sure about that. You're not sure the Dutch would approve of that. But mm, this idea sure. of the Dutch maid is always very primly turned out. The little kind of bonnet. Yeah, little apron, clean apron. Yeah, with clogs. tulips on it. Yeah, wearing clogs. And I suppose it, it does. Even now, it captures a kind of. There's a kind of innocence, a neatness, an earnestness to it, yeah. um, which I suppose you could you would say absolutely captures that spirit of and uh, and a healthiness, I think. Yeah, healthiness. And, yeah. and when would you say the heyday of the Dutch maid ends then, or does it never end? I, uh, well, I think I think it endures as an emblem of of the Dutch Republic and then yeah the various iterations of what becomes the Netherlands. Um, I think it, it's still you know as you say it still has a, a certain potency. But the Dutch Golden Age peters out when late. 17th century? Uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. And I suppose that's- It's the Louis point. the 14th. Right. And that's the point at which the, the art, you know, when we think about Dutch art, we think of early 17th century, don't we, I suppose? Yeah. So it, it, it becomes increasingly kind of uh, uh, under the shadow of French militarism and yeah. British naval power. But, you know, it blazes a path. And that is absolutely part of what makes the Dutch Republic fascinating. But it's also the fact, you know, I mean, it's so distinctive and, uh, and, yeah. and brilliant a culture in its own right. Yeah. Um, and we will definitely come back to the Dutch Republic. I know we've been saying that a lot, but this is the first well, this dipping of the toe into the subject. Exactly. And if I was to go now, Tom, to Amsterdam and to ask for a Dutch maid, <laughs> well, well, we, hopefully we may end up going to Amsterdam, perhaps. That would be a brilliant place for a rest is history walking tour, wouldn't it? Yeah, we could, we could try that out, couldn't we? Y- yes, you can try that out. Uh, I'll- <laughs> no, you, you suggested it. You suggested it. But for now, for now, uh, I think that's enough. So that was, uh, that was, thanks that, very much for listening. That was splendid. And yes. Thank that's you. inspired thank me you. to go and hoover my house <laughs> of some such. Uh, 
So on that one, to do it for you, yeah, I think exactly. it's proper, uh, proper Dutch behavior. <laughs> we'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.